I just want to introduce you. This is Peter C. Brown. He is one of the co-authors of the fantastic book, Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning. The book is from Harvard University Press. And if we were going to distill down some of the key findings, could you explain a couple of those for us? I, I found the whole process really intriguing to, to learn the science and then to try to uh, animate it through stories of real people and incidents in their lives and, and how they handled them and how that revealed a, a fundamental learning in the science of how we learn. I came away at the end uh, uh, thinking there are really, for me, four big ideas. Uh, the first one is that uh, we think of learning as getting stuff into the brain, but it, it turns out that learning really happens when we struggle to get stuff out of the brain. It's that effort to uh, recall, uh, explain, uh, relate, put in our own words uh, something new or or a new skill or semantic knowledge that really leads to the learning of moving the, the new material from short-term memory into long-term memory and connecting it to what we already know. So getting it out, not trying to put it in, is key. And most of us, when we're trying to get something new, we'll just reread and reread and, and try to re-expose ourselves to it to, to burn it in. That doesn't work. The second big idea, uh, for me is that there are some kinds of difficulties that are, in fact, desirable for long-term learning. Uh, I have made the point that trying to get learning out of the mind is an important strategy. Turns out if you space out your practice so that you've gotten a little rusty on the new material and it takes extra effort to retrieve it, that, that added difficulty causes the mind to reconsolidate the learning and it strengthens the connections to what you already know and the, and the cues to retrieve it again later. There are other difficulties like mixing up the practice of similar problem types instead of focusing on one type. You're, you know, you're, like the 20-foot putt. Like the 20-foot putt or yeah. in baseball, it, you know, a typical strategy would be to swing at 15 fastballs and 15 curveballs and 15 change-ups and in practice you can see a lot of improvement. But if those 45 pitches come randomly, you really struggle because each time you've got to figure out what kind of a pitch it is and how to hit it. You don't think you're doing too well, but later when you're tested with random pitches, you do a whole lot better. So this idea of mixing up your learning if you're trying to identify bird species or the works of painters, it doesn't feel like you're getting it, but you get a much more nuanced understanding and ability to transfer that knowledge to unfamiliar settings. So mixed practice is uh, interleaving the, the practice of similar problem types is a very powerful difficulty that is desirable. And there are some others as well. So uh, there are certainly difficulties that are not desirable. If you're trying to read something in a language you don't know, that's an undesirable difficulty. Yeah. I mean, we can think of many undesirable difficulties, but not all difficulty is undesirable. The third big idea for me is this notion that when we learn something new, we are actually, uh, you know, getting, it's not like getting a new bump on the head, but we are rewiring our brains. We're, <laughs> we're our neurons are growing new axons to connect with other neurons. This came home to me visually in a video of a clip, a Nova TV clip of uh, the neuroscientist Eric Kandel, who's won a Nobel uh, uh, for his work, where he, you can actually see a video of a sea slug neuron being stimulated and the axon growing out to reach another neuron. That uh. it is a physical phenomenon. The point being that uh, through the right kind of mental engagement, the right kind of effort, we are changing our minds and increasing our mental abilities. That our mental abilities are not fixed with the gift of our genes. We have the ability to substantially uh, affect our mental abilities through the right kinds of, of learning effort. It, it rewires the brain. If it feels difficult, well, there's a reason. You're actually rewiring yeah. things. You're making a new path. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so this, this I find, uh, a, a, a positive uh, feature to uh, counterweigh somewhat the fact that we think some kinds of difficulties are desirable, that we know it from the, from the research. And it's been shown that people who have this, uh, what um, uh, Dr. Carol Dweck, uh, the psychologist at Stanford, calls a growth mindset mm -hmm. instead of a fixed one. A fixed mindset is... If it's not coming to me, uh, I must be dumb. You know, it exceeds my natural gifts. A growth mindset says if it's not coming to me, I must need to try a different way or try a little harder, that uh, notion of persistence. And her research shows 
that when students or other learners understand they are actually changing their minds uh, physically uh, through that kind of effort, they are motivated to, uh, to pick tougher problems and persist longer. So the third big idea for me is this idea of a growth mindset. The fourth one uh, is evidence from the research that what feels productive often is not, that our intuition often leads us astray. <laughs> and this is your 20-foot putt example because mm -hmm. you can spend uh, quite a bit of time practicing your 20-foot putt or your, your four-foot bean bag uh, or uh, your uh, uh, solving of the, finding the, the volume of a geometric solid like a spheroid until you just, you see you've got it nailed. What you don't understand is that that uh, improvement resides in short-term memory. Mm. And it hasn't been consolidated in long-term memory. It takes uh, hours or days for learning to be migrated from short-term memory to long-term memory. And uh, you walk off the uh, golf course or you leave your classroom uh, with that practice feeling you've got it nailed or you spent all night in an all-nighter and, and you, and you, and you, and you in, do yeah. well the next day on the exam, you think I've locked that stuff in. Mm -hmm. You come, if you come back a week later, you haven't. You're astonished to discover it's leaked away in the meantime. So you cannot trust uh, your sense of what feels productive as a gauge of whether you're truly learning. The, uh, the gauge you need is uh, to demonstrate uh, through retrieval practice, through doing it again right. later, uh, whether in fact you have uh, achieved that or not. So one of the benefits of spacing out your practice mm -hmm. is you get a, a, a more honest reading of whether you've in fact mastered uh, the, the topic that you're uh, dealing with. And it's more than just looking at it again, it's actually it's not, testing it's not, yourself. It's not a matter of looking at it again, yeah. it's a matter of, of having the question posed and being able to come up with the answer and being able to explain the answer, being able to elaborate on it. Uh, that uh, is just a, a, a fundamental important uh, part of learning and the uh, the impulse to reread and review mm -hmm. uh, will build a kind of uh, familiarity with the text, a fluency with the text. It's easily mistaken for mastery. Mm -hmm. But A, it doesn't stick, mm -hmm. and B, um, you can't it, explain below the surface of the language that you've mm -hmm. memorized what uh, you're really describing. So that, that's the challenge of moving beyond the illusion of mastery by uh, requiring yourself to demonstrate mastery uh, through quizzes, flashcards, uh, you know, frequent low stakes quizzes are just a, mm -hmm. a sort of the bottom line thing that right. we, we found from this research are really important ways of locking in your learning and carrying it forward and knowing what you've got and what you don't have and need to practice.